humans are mammals. Yeah. Breast milk is raw milk. Yeah. Please breast, breastfeed your babies. Vegan mom breastfeeds her baby. The baby gets raw fat, mm -hmm. animal fat. That's a very big clue that in fact, the vegans are missing something really critical. Doctors and researchers like yourself are authorized to use as basis for foundation of belief. Without bacteria in our body, we'd last about, I don't know, one or two days and we'd die. Remember, prebiotics feed probiotics that create postbiotics. If anything, I'll, I'll jump in and do a study with some scientists because like that's would... right now I have some elk meat and some deer venison and stuff in our freezer right now. And I think that's the best, like, because I feel great. That's one. That's awesome. One that's thing. great. The dairy industry in America right now is literally on its back. Uh, in America, we are driven by money. Yeah. So dollar voting matters. It really does. I always thought milk was the culprit that um your milk causes inflammation that's like the saying but that's because that's pasteurized but raw right. milk does the opposite pasteurized milk is very inflammatory raw milk is very anti-inflammatory mm -hmm. for asthma allergies eczema anything that's inflammatory raw milk suppresses inflammation you know you wonder in america why we got so many crazy people they don't feel well mm -hmm. remember the pasteurized milk is the number one number one yeah most allergenic food at the at the FDA website for allergenic foods. Oh, wow. Google most allergenic foods. Number one, you're having some sunshine on you and getting dirty once in a while. Yeah, exactly. And making sure your, all your foods are natural and whole. Yeah. Uh, you know, all those kinds of things are very, very natural processes that make us healthier and happier. Um, I've got my prop. I've got my prop here. Oh yeah, that's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, now you're back. You're back east, right? You're in uh, Michigan, or yeah, it's like a 25 minute drive north of Detroit. Yeah, got it. And um, I guess I'll introduce myself. Since you don't really know me, but I'm a big fan of your work. And um, I, I first saw your farm in uh, Paul Saladino's podcast that you did. Um, I was actually watching a little bit of it because I'm not done yet. But yeah, uh -huh. a lot of cool uh, topics you guys covered. But yeah, my name's Sadat, and uh, I'm a master's in biology uh, student at Miami Miami University. It's a conservation biology degree, and uh, I'm also an independent uh, filmmaker. I recently bought this camera to uh, up my tool set because I've, I've just been using my iPhone. And uh, so I got a better camera and just learning about filmmaking. And I'm also a writer. I'm uploading articles to my Substack. And I've self-published a book, and I've just always been obsessed with animals and ecosystems. But my second passion is cooking, and um, just just cooking meat and all types of food. That's that's another passion of mine. So I'm trying to combine the two, like ecosystems, biology, with natural food products, and just kind of trying to share to the masses like the benefits of eating natural and just getting away from the processed stuff and the the altered stuff. You know. Um, I agree. Mm -hmm. I've done a solo road trip across the U.S. in the summer of 2021, right after I graduated from Wayne State University in Detroit with my computer science degree. My, my heart lies with animals. I, I should have followed my heart and done zoology at Michigan State, but I, I was so deep into computer science, I just decided to just hunker through and just finish it because I only had a year left when I decided I didn't want to do it anymore. And uh, But yeah, then I did that road trip across the country and went to a lot of national parks. And I actually went to Sequoia National Park and went to San Jose where I got some family in San Jose. And uh, I think I stayed at Fresno for a bit, but at the time I didn't know about uh, the farm. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I love animals. I'm obsessed with animals and I've done a lot of traveling and at national parks and wild places. But yeah, um, in case any of my viewers don't know who you are, would you mind in introducing yourself and what you do? Yes, um, <clears throat> I am the founder and owner, along with my brothers and my son and daughter, mm -hmm. of Raw Farm. Raw Farm is the largest raw milk, dairy, and creamery and brand in the world. Right mm -hmm. here, there you go. That product is found in about 600 stores throughout California, a natural food product store like Sprout Stores and Mm -hmm. Air One and Lazy Acres, that kind of store. Um, okay. And it is the top selling. It's grown in this last year. Our products grew 28%. Oh, wow. And so it's a huge amount of growth in that period of time. And the last four years have been monumental growth periods. But 
in, as my role as CEO and founder of our farm. And um, I've also founded and I'm the chairman of the Raw Milk Institute mm-hmm. because I believe even though we founded our operations about 23 years ago, we started back in 1999, mm-hmm. that I felt that the research we had performed on how to pr- produce raw milk safely, with low risk, mm-hmm. uh, was something that was a matter of such grand, important purpose that we would want to share it with everyone, mm-hmm. all farmers everywhere in the world. And so Raw Milk Institute is a nonprofit organization, which I'm a board member of, and we train farmers. We've trained over 2,000 farmers internationally in the last 12 years to produce raw milk um, according to very, very low risk protocols. Let's put it that way. Okay. Using different standards. So that's kind of a little bit about me. I'm also um, a father and a husband and a grandfather and yeah. uh, all around kind of a humanitarian kind of guy who believes in nutrition for everyone. Yeah, that's awesome. I think our thoughts align in a lot of ways because um, I'm always talking about like the meat you purchase, like what is what was that animal composed of? Like what did that animal eat to grow into what it was? Because that determines how healthy that animal's meat is and how healthy that animal's milk and eggs are. So yeah, that's something I think is ignored a lot in, in modern society. It's just like how many grams of protein are you eating a day? But we don't really ask like, what are the quality of, of those grams of protein? So yeah, that's well, something I believe in a lot. <laughs> to put a finer point on that, there is a really big problem with policy in America. And I say policy because regulatory policy at the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration says that there shall be no, no uh, medical claims or health benefits about food. Mm-hmm. That anytime you make a medical claim or a health benefit claim on food, you have created a new unapproved FDA drug, and that's a crime. So there is an innate detachment, separation, distance created between food and healing, food and health. And I've been at, I've been at odds with the FDA for 20 years over this because um, they won't allow me as a producer of raw milk, who has a tremendous amount of medical benefits, which I can go into, yeah. uh, to show any of the links, the PubMed links. And as you know, PubMed is the rigorously researched, uh, peer-reviewed journal-published articles that come from all over the world that mm-hmm. are at the NIH, at the National Institute of Health and the CDC, which doctors and researchers like yourself are authorized to use as basis for foundation of belief. Yeah. Uh, and and PubMed is there's I could I can name seventy PubMed researched articles in the last fifteen years that have been put out about the medical benefits of raw milk. Mm-hmm. Huge benefits. Yeah. But yet they sue me and threaten to put me in jail if I show those links on yeah. our websites. Oh wow. So how how are consumers supposed to do better if they don't know better? Yeah. Um, there's a major problem here. And so it's only the enlightened people that are actually figuring this out because if you're following the herd, you're in trouble. Oh yeah. It's um I think uh the farmer Joel Salatin, he also has his issues with FDA and USDA. Yes. Yeah. Yes. I honestly I I'm, I'm pretty new to be to being a researcher because my undergrad was computer science, totally different. <laughs> so I I almost feel like I got a bit of uh, imposter syndrome, but I'm learning as as fast as I can. Um, just recently I'm, I've learned how to like use peer reviewed papers to support my claims and stuff. So yeah, it's been a, a shift, but I really do like what I'm doing right now. And, um, so one question I like to start off with, with guests is, um, what got you into what you're doing right now? Like when you were a kid, what were you passionate about? Was it anything to do with what you're doing right now? Or did you find it later on in life? Well, I was an adult, a Dell Davis ba- a baby. My mom, uh, believed in Adele Davis back in the 1960s. I'm 62 years old. Mm-hmm. So I was okay. in Bur- Brewers East, molasses, and all kinds of interesting things back in the 60s. Mm-hmm. My mom was kind of a hippie of the 60s. But um, no, I, I'm actually doing things quite differently today than I grew up doing. Um, okay. When I was a, a child, I was a uh, I was the oldest of five brothers. And I was a, uh, My dad was a farmer. Mm-hmm. He did quite a bit of traveling also. But um, my first job out of high school, I was a welder in high school, a welder on the farm, and doing all kinds of things on the farm, repairing things. But I was in a mine um, up in the Sierra Nevadas, yeah. not far from Sequoia's that you had visited. Oh yeah, that's um, a beautiful spot. <laughs> I, I saw a guy almost get killed 
and a helicopter came oh, wow. in and picked him up and took him off to the hospital and saved his life. Well, when that helicopter landed, I saw it happen, and it was like blew my mind how exciting it was, the paramedics in the orange jumpsuits and the rotor wash. I want to do that. I, I went and got my pre-med taken care of, and I became a certified paramedic, 2,500-hour course here at Valley Medical Center in Fresno County. And I was a paramedic for 17 years. I was on a helicopter. I was on swift water rescue. I was, um, I, tr I taught paramedic medicine at the health department. I was mm -hmm. uh, in administration. I was actually a pilot for a short period of time for the oh, helicopter, wow. not for the helicopter, but the, as a fixed wing pilot for the EMS administration. So I really immersed myself in the most mm -hmm. acute human crises you can imagine, which is mm -hmm. dialing 911. Yeah. And so I had 15,000 of these experiences with human beings that were crying out for help um, over oh, that wow. 17 years of period of time. I, in 1996, retired from that. And my grandparents had passed away and left a thousand acres of ground to my brothers and I, and they didn't want to farm. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of done with 24 hour shifts and not getting any sleep. So my wife wow. established our farming operations, but I was very, very focused on one thing. For 17 years, I touched people and I was helped people by touching them and helping them to not die today. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to do that in farming. I wanted to touch people directly. I did not want to serve a processor. I wanted to serve humanity and people directly. Mm -hmm. That was a very, very, very formative thing to happen because <clears throat> it changed everything in how I farmed. Um, we embraced the organic concepts. We uh, sold directly to people. We did research about human health. Um, yeah. And we look for, for those kind of premium differentiation. So very early on, uh, our operations became vertically integrated. We uh, produced grass, we produced alfalfa and feed, and we feed our own cows. And then those cows then produced their own milk. That milk was raw, not pasteurized, because in California, raw milk is legal. And in mm -hmm. 1999, I did not know that the Altadena brand, which was a large raw brand in Los Angeles, had been sold. And so we came into existence right after that, but I was listening. And so when people said, we want our milk raw, I listened and I served. And so that was 23, almost 24 years ago. Mm -hmm. And now we have the world's largest raw milk dairy and it's thriving, growing, yeah. thriving, doing great. My kids are involved. My son's the president. My daughter's in charge of the social networks and, mar and marketing. My yeah. son-in-law does all the logistics distribution. My wife helps with quality insurance. She's also a nurse. That's so amazing. a big medical background helped me understand the gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. uh, super important right now in terms of human genomics, proteomics, lipidomics, yeah. all those things about what makes humans human. And, and I find it fascinating, you know, in, in 2001, that um, the DOE, the Department of Energy, mm -hmm. uh, funded along with Princeton University, MIT, and some other organizations, funded the uh, Human Genome Project. And if you haven't looked at that project, it's fascinating okay. to realize that, yeah, mom and dad gave us 23,000 genes, 23 and me, right? Yeah. But that was just the hardware that makes us look like mom and dad. Yeah. That's not the software that drives us to do the right things in our bodies. The software is the bacterial DNA that crosstalks with our cellular DNA at the cellular level. And that's completely lost on modern medicine but mm -hmm. so critical to our health because we are missing bandwidths of this bacterial DNA because of the way we sterilize our food, pasteurize our food, take yeah. antibiotics, preservatives on our food, all these things we do to extend shelf life, yeah. but destroy our gut life, right? Yeah, yeah. Remember, 80% of your immune system is the intestines, the, the gut. Um, 80%. Uh, mm -hmm. it, 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 and so, you know, one thing that raw milk does, is it's the first food of life. Yep. Raw milk, the colostrum, mammals breastfeed their baby. Colostrum yeah. and then milk, yeah, is provides a biodiversity of bacteria and the food that feeds it. Mm -hmm. So a baby's born without an immune system. Guess what? Raw milk and raw colostrum. That's what f flushes the gut, which mm -hmm. then uh, seeds in and then feeds that that bacterial diversity. That actually forms the, the first part of our immune system. Yeah, and so uh, it's a powerful food, and mm -hmm. I have great respect for mother nature's blueprints that have occurred over the last 150, 200,000 years yeah. to make mammals what they are and, and actually build immune systems through raw milk. Yeah, I saw that on your website's about page, the fact that you want to harness nature's blueprints. I, I really yes. appreciate that, um, that you're trying to do that and that you are doing that. 
Um, so that's amazing. Um, I mean, I don't even know where to start. This is my main passion. You know, it's like you're tying ecology and uh, natural food products and how they are healthy for human bodies together. So you're still saving lives, but you're doing it in a different way. Um, instead, of, instead of saving one or two or four lives in an mm -hmm. ambulance call, hundreds of thousands of people are being positively impacted by having stronger immune systems. If you remember back to February and March of 2020, mm -hmm. What did the doctors tell us when COVID hit? They said, don't come to us, stay at home, you're on your own, there's nothing we can do. Mm, yeah. That scared the living hell out of most people, right? Oh, yeah, yeah <laughs> oh, God, I, I can't go. I can't go get a shot. Mm -hmm. I can't get an antibiotic. I can't, I can't get help. I am on my own. Well, I know that a lot of people started doing research and realizing what kinds of foods should I be eating to build my immune system? Mm -hmm. What more powerful food to use than the first food of life? which builds the first beginnings of your immune system before it was even formed, right? Yeah. You, you, took, you took a place where you had virtually none to mm -hmm. a place where you have a strong immune system in the most weak part of life, being mm -hmm. born. So people started to embrace raw milk crazy. I mean, they were embracing it before that, but I mean, it, it took a notch level, a much higher level, when people realized my life depends on a strong immune system and sales have gone crazy ever since. They were going good before, but now they're, they're crazy. Sorry about that. Yeah, because no. of uh, because of people's shift and and trying to increase their immune health, so they were started looking at doing some bit of their own research, and they probably came across raw milk. And um, I was wondering, does does eating raw organs also help increase your immune health, like a raw liver or a raw whatever organ? I would say. I don't know enough about that to answer that question, but I do know that there's very, very good information coming from archaeological research okay. where the American Indians, when they would kill a, a buffalo or whatever, or a deer, the first thing they do is they go to the adrenals and eat the adrenals. Oh, yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, the kidneys. Uh, what do the adrenals have? They had vitamins. They had vitamin C. They had all these wonderful things. Um, and the organ meat was always the privileged meat. It was the good meat. That was the first thing they would want. So that's not what we do today, unfortunately, which we eat the steak, right? We mm -hmm. don't eat the organs. I, I think there's a lot of great science supporting eating organ meat because they're so rich in, in vitamins nutrients. and minerals. In that one movie, Dances with Wolves, um, yeah. uh, the Lakota. Kevin Costner, yeah. Yeah, I forgot the, the character's name, but the, the Lakota Indian who... Um, cut open the bison, he took the heart out and took a bite out of it before anything right. else. So right. yeah, they really value that, the organs more than the meat. And I guess, I mean, it makes sense because the meat of an animal is kind of the least nutritious part of that animal compared to everything else in the body. Um, yep. in, in our freezer right now, we have uh, livers and hearts and stuff. I, I, I ordered a big order from Polyface Farms over the internet yeah. through, their, uh, through their website. And so yeah, we, we I'm, it's mainly, me that eats it but um every now and then i'll thaw it out and i try to eat a few a bit of it raw and then i'll cook it and stuff as well so at first the first time i did it it was kind of you know uh very unfamiliar but i, <laughs> I got i got a piece of liver down and then i i heard the trick of putting a little bit of maple syrup on it that helped out a lot so and now i can do it pretty regularly i, I have raw organs like once a week and I feel better, that's for sure. I haven't. I don't know how to test my my health on how it's affecting me with real data, but I certainly feel better. And I mean, it's got everything. It's got protein too. It's very dense in protein than than the meat, the liver of it. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. there's no question. Yeah, uh, Doctor Saladino, Doctor Saladino, mm -hmm. uh, Paul said you, you've been watching his videos with me. Yeah, uh, he's a huge proponent of organ meats, and um, he's a huge supporter of raw milk as well. He's an MD. Yeah. Mm -hmm. in internal medicine and he was also a psychiatrist i find it very interesting is that the dopamine and serotonin that's synthesized in your body is synthesized where in the intestines mm -hmm. and where does it go to your brain oh wow. so the yeah. gut brain axis is really critical about how good you feel mm -hmm. yeah. dopamine and serotonin make you feel good right they calm you you know you wonder in america why we got so many crazy people they don't feel well it's because they, their guts aren't working yeah. well mm -hmm. and so if, if we would have a more of a primitive diet which we ate whole foods yeah that would synthesize the right hormones to go to your brain and neurotransmitters to go to your brain and <laughs> and those kinds of things with all the natural cholesterols and amino acids fatty acids all those things that are supposed to be the natural sugars everything natural instead of preserved or highly processed yeah um, and that intent 
that intent is to extend shelf life, not necessarily nourishing, by the way. Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's that's what I'm a, a big proponent against. Like the, these are things that aren't even supposed to be edible. They're just supposed to preserve the products and yeah, increase the shelf life, like you said. And on, on Paul Saladino, Dr. Paul Saladino, um, I loved his videos when I first discovered him like a year or two ago. And I didn't find, I can't still to this day find anyone who's that truthful as him, where he's just exposing these uh, bigger corporations uh, I personally would be kind of scared to talk negative about McDonald's and stuff because they're such a huge company, you know, but he's well, doing it. He's he, doing he, lives, it. he lives in Costa Rica for a reason, I think. Oh, really? <laughs> wow. Yeah, he That's lives awesome. in Costa Rica. <laughs> well, I really yeah. appreciate it because, like, everyone's quiet, you know, and these, like, huge companies are just running the show with all the processed foods. And um, they kind of – I heard they – I don't even know if I'll include this in the podcast, but um, I heard they, they paired up with the medicine, medicine industry to – have some agreements where you know they're saying like their their food isn't that bad the processed foods aren't the culprit but i mean the data shows that it is the culprit that natural foods is the way to become healthy again eating natural foods well our our country is not based on prevention of disease our country is based on uh taking advantage of the profitability of disease mm -hmm. uh, doctors are not uh what's the word i want to use healers they're not spending time with you to actually calm you down and open your mind and get you to understand what makes you well they're simply trying to find some kind of a way to heal your current sign or symptom um, you know it's it's really quite tragic when you think about the world we are not leading the world in medicine in terms of of care or prevention at all yeah we're doing it quite poorly We've got some great advanced medicine here, but I'll tell you what, we're not doing anything to prevent disease from occurring, or exactly. very little, put it that way. And the reason goes back to that first statement I made, which is we have bifurcated, we've divided and separated and made it illegal to connect healing foods with health. Yeah. Uh, in other words, that, that means drink as much Coca-Cola and, and Doritos as you want all day long, and who cares? Yeah. When you become a, become a diabetic, we'll, he, we'll take care of you with insulin. I mean, no, that's insane. Yeah. Uh, that really is. It, it's it, it, like it's they're putting crazy. they're putting band aids on gushing wounds without addressing the the root of the problem. Yeah, um, yep. that's right. With American medicine, it's it's like um, they they don't even want you to to get better. It seems like they just want to keep you coming back to them for the new prescription medicine or a new type of treatment. And like if you could have just solved the root issue. And I, this is why um, I met somebody when I went to Brazil with my university. We came back from an expedition in South America, and I was on a uh -huh. plane, and the person I was sitting to on the plane, she, like, on my way back to America, she was, um, she was Brazilian. Uh, she was a doctor in Virginia, and she was, we got talking that entire flight, and she told me that uh, the potential of immunology, I think that's what she said, like, immuno immunology, I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but it, that sector in medicine has huge potential because because of everything we just discussed. Like, they're going to start to shift toward that eventually, or they should at least, you know, yep. start preventative care more instead yep. of, yeah, just... It goes it goes back to harnessing Mother Nature's blueprints. Mm -hmm. our, our bodies have whole systems and pathways meant to heal itself. Yeah, and to understand how those pathways work and capitalize them to make them work in overtime to heal, protect, and and actually get rid of disease is a fascinating medical pathway, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the primary pathway before you even have to do that artificially is to do it naturally. Yeah, uh, mm -hmm. is to okay, why did you get sick? Well, you became autoimmune. You had an autoimmune disease because you lost your bandwidth. You lost your uh, ability for the information at the cellular level to actually keep your body going correctly in terms of the information that drives your system to work. Yeah, uh, Our bodies get really stupid and dumb if they don't have the genomic, genetic information at the cellular level to drive metabolic functions. And, you know, this whole idea that we become sterilized in these sterile bubbles, um, it's a bubble of trouble, not something that, go ahead and knock the door there. We have a store here. Oh, yeah. Um, no problem. So we really, really get in a lot of trouble when we start isolating ourselves from the external microbiome or macrobiome around us mm -hmm. because we are born of it. We are part of it. Mm -hmm. And if we separate ourselves from it, we can actually become quite ill. So yeah. uh, having some sunshine on you and getting dirty once in a while. Yeah, exactly. And making sure your, all your foods are natural and whole. Yeah. Uh, you know, all those kinds of things are very, very natural processes that 
make us healthier and happier. Yeah, that's why I, I spend a lot of time outside sometimes without any footwear, just walking barefoot mm -hmm. a little bit on, on our grass. And we don't use any chemicals on our grass, so I'm confident there's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. So every day, you know, we have turkeys. We have turkeys and we had ducks and chickens. We processed them all. But right now we got two big turkeys, broad-breasted bronze turkeys. So, you know, every morning I got to take them out, put food in their feeder and water in their waterer. And I do that barefoot sometimes, you know. I think that helps a lot with um, a lot of reasons, like the, the bacteria. Your skin is meant to do its job, right? To protect your internal functions. And I feel like a lot of us, our skin is just not doing its job and it's kind of forgetting how to do its job. And that's how mm -hmm. your immune system gets weakened. Uh, that's right. Um, we believe that there are two kinds of raw milk in this world. Mm. Raw milk that's intended and produced for pasteurization and raw milk that's intended for use and consumption by people. So pasteurization people, completely different standards, practices, the way you go about doing that. Unfortunately, our FDA will not acknowledge raw milk for people. It only has one kind of raw milk in the world and it's filthy and it must be pasteurized. Okay. Unfortunately, the dairy industry in America right now is literally on its back. The cost of production is lower I mean, excuse me, the cost production is far above what they're receiving as far as price uh, milk. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you need about 18 to $20 a hundred weight just to break even. Mm -hmm. And they're getting 14 to 15 right now. So you're seeing a mass exodus continuing, just hemorrhaging of dairymen. But you're not losing cows, you're losing farmers. Mm -hmm. So you still have the same 9.7 million cows in America, but you have fewer and fewer dairies having them. So you have more and more 10 and 20,000 cow dairies that are set regionally like Northern Texas or someplace in Arizona or, or New Mexico or someplace. Um, and it's becoming a critical, critical problem because we've centralized and, and condensed our food systems into such a uh, few operators that now if you have any kind of a speed bump, the entire thing collapses. We saw that in, in, in COVID where our operations were able to respond immediately to the demand for dairy products because remember they closed the stores, oh, excuse me, they closed the restaurants, they closed the schools mm -hmm. and all the open was the stores for about 60 days in California. In some stores, we were the only raw, we were the only dairy product there, raw or pasteurized. Gotcha. Because yeah. they have lack, lack of the ability for the larger, huge mechanized system to be resilient to the local demand. Mm -hmm. So it's very interesting um, food security, uh, food independence, food resiliency. Oh yeah, uh, behaviors going on here uh, yeah. that's not good for America either. So it's really interesting that the raw milk for people is super clean, comes from known farmers, very high standards, testing all kinds of cool stuff that gets five to ten times more per gallon than the milk that's intended for pasteurization, but it's highly mm -hmm. sustainable because it's so good for the gut. Mm -hmm. Remember that pasteurized milk is the number one, number one yeah. most allergenic food at the at the FDA website for allergenic foods. Oh, wow. Google most allergenic foods, number one. It's up there with that. peanuts and everything else. Number one. That's crazy. It's also very, very difficult to digest. Yeah. Lactose intolerance, maldigestion, all kinds of issues with the ability to assimilate and digest pasteurized milk. And it also has some flavor issues too. Mm -hmm. The number one thing that people say about our raw milk is, and all raw milks that are done properly, oh my God, it's delicious. Number yeah. one, it's delicious. So you have delicious, actually very good for allergies. The raw whey protein, that's W-H-E-Y, whey protein, yeah. found in raw milk stabilizes mast cells, M-A-S-T, the mast cells, which release histamines. Mm -hmm. So if you stabilize mast cells, the allergy response is, is diminished and reduced and controlled, meaning mm -hmm. mitigated. So that's why you find raw milk is so good for asthma, allergies, eczema, anything that's inflammatory, raw milk suppresses inflammation. Yeah. And suppression of inflammation is a huge pathway um, that we're having a big problem with because so many things are inflammatory and we have chronic inflammation going on, which is driving disease processes in yeah. America. So you need to have foods which control inflammation yeah allows to have a spike of inflammation it goes back to normal and low so you can actually rest because if you're chronic in chronic inflammation your body becomes in overdrive in terms of allergic to everything mm -hmm. you actually start having disease processes break out and that's not good at all for you know you know control of illness at all yeah 
Well, that's something I just now learned because I always thought milk was the culprit that um, your milk causes inflammation. That's like the saying, but that's because that's pasteurized. But raw right. milk does the opposite. Okay. Exactly the opposite. Yeah. Uh, pasteurized milk is very inflammatory. Raw milk is very anti inflammatory. Mm -hmm. um, the heating process at 145 to 220 degrees, whichever the protocol is that that particular pasteurization uh, does all kinds of things. It denatures proteins, inactivates enzymes, kills bacteria. Um, it does a bunch of stuff. Mm -hmm. And and when that happens, your body doesn't know what to do with it. Yeah. You know, it, your body's used to living whole things and dead pieces of things like lysed bacteria uh, <clears throat> make your mast cells go crazy to try to create mucus to get rid of it. What, do you, not to be what does that mean though? You said lysed bacteria, what does that mean? Lysing, mm -hmm. um, when you heat milk, mm -hmm. the way that the bacteria is killed, which is the intention of pasteurization, is to break open the cell membrane. Okay. So the extracellular membrane is lysed, it's broken open, it's lysed. Okay. Um, that lysing process is created by heat. It busts them open. Well, what happens when that happens? Everything inside the cell is released outside. Mm -hmm. So now you got a mess of yeah. all these bacterial dead pieces. Yeah, broken parts. Bad, <laughs> yeah. The body parts. Yeah. And your body goes, wait a minute, that's not supposed to be here. Yeah. Um, and, and you get this release of histamines and mucus that actually is trying to get it out. Man, I really wish we had some access to raw milk, but in Michigan, it's uh, I think illegal to sell it. <laughs> you, but, you actually can't. You actually can get it. I've been in Michigan many, many years ago, uh, and raw milk is legal there on the farm from cow shares. Okay. So you have to kind of be in the the path. You have to kind of go find it. Yeah. But it's available. I know of several farmers there that produce raw milk. Okay. In fact, if you go to the rawmilkinstitute.org, raw milk you'll find a couple of Michigan farmers there. Rawmilkinstitute.org. Okay. On ORG. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just putting it in my notes. I'm going to search all this stuff yeah. up. And um, that that is the organization which trains farmers, not only here in California, but across the United States and Canada and all the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. We train farmers in India. We train farmers in Beirut, Lebanon. We train farmers in England, oh, wow. uh, New Zealand, Australia, all over the world uh, to produce raw milk safely. We have a PhD from Rutgers University, Dr. Bruce, uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Joseph Heckman, mm -hmm. that is on the board. We have a, an RN on mm -hmm. the board. We've got a uh, NASA uh, oh, wow. uh, risk management person on the board. So yeah, it's really, it's a cool board. We've been around for 12 years now. Uh, we've got veterinarians to support us. We've got biologists. We've got all kinds of people that That's all support awesome. us. And we've established these standards, which now have peer review, peer reviewed, and those standards are actually yeah. now published and listed at PubMed, mm -hmm. showing the raw meat effect or the raw milk institute effect of when you train farmers to uh, produce raw milk safely mm -hmm. and you do testing on a routine basis, guess what? The risk profile of that milk is like near zero. It's not zero, but it's close to it. Yeah. Um, so you, you said, uh, Paul Saladino, Dr. Paul Saladino lives in Costa Rica for a reason. So would you say <laughs> it would be safe for me to include everything we discussed so far? Like if I upload it all or should I take out some of the bits where I was talking no, about, okay. You, you, I, you, you control your website, you control your podcast. Mm -hmm. I can say whatever I want on yours. Uh -huh. I can't say it on my own. Okay. So gotcha. you. This is you. You control it. I, I I can't tell you what to do. You can do what you want, mm -hmm. and the FDA can't control you because this is freedom of speech. You can do what you want. Yeah. Uh, so I would love for people to hear what I've said today. Yeah. I just can't say it on a website that I control. Yeah, I gotcha. That's why. That's why I want to grow my page with more um, views, obviously, and try to get some videos to go viral. And once I have like a substantial platform, I want to start really, you know, exposing those people that should be exposed for the health of our nation and stuff. So. Um, yeah. like, like this weekend, I'm going to be going up north in Michigan, not the Upper Peninsula, but near uh, Gaylord. There's this farm, uh, beautiful, biodiverse, regenerative farm. It's called Serendipity Farms. The owner, mm. her name is uh, Wendy. So we, Wendy and I, we're very close. And so I'm going to be staying there for, I don't know, two nights and just recording recording as much as I can. And then I'll come back and just start editing it and try to, I'm going to try to make a short film just uh that showcases all the natural processes that she is harnessing. She is also harnessing because um, her systems are just amazing. She has these forest pigs. So she'll mm -hmm. let her pigs go into the forest and th then these wild turkeys come 
and then you see the pigs interacting with the turkeys and it's just a full-blown ecosystem i've never seen anything like it um those pigs are eating acorns and grubs and they probably have much lower linoleic uh acid content in their meat versus like walmart bacon (laughs) i'm sure Sure. that (laughs) but uh yeah so i'm excited for that that's gonna give me get me a lot of experience because that's like a full two days of recording in this it's a it's a photographer's paradise there's cows there's horses there's ducks um so yeah i'm looking forward to that and then trying to make that go viral with a good thumbnail and title combination but yeah and then i got to write out a script for it and i'm really trying to make my videos uh influence the viewers to start maybe consuming raw milk or pasture raised eggs instead of the normal eggs and yeah i'm still figuring out how to send that message without sounding imposing or commanding because nobody likes that these days either Uh, which is unfortunate i think i think we're a little overly sensitive like the newer generation but i gotta adapt you know i was interviewed just four days ago Mm -hmm. from a writer that had seen some stuff going on with the raw milk and wanted to know more about it and he interviewed me and the article when it was written had nothing to do with me and nothing to do with the positive things about raw milk it was some spin he had with the fda oh my and, gosh <laughs> and, and something he said about hippies and hippies and preppers <laughs> he considered raw milk to be like hippies and preppers and anti-vaxxers i said are you crazy yeah i, I couldn't believe he said that raw milk in california is consumed by massive amounts of normal people yeah no hippie yeah they, okay. no they'll try preppers. to paint yeah they'll try to paint no, an inaccurate no. picture of you <laughs> no yeah and it was like quite sad because uh, clearly he had an agenda of some kind to create more of a fringe movement about it but mm-hmm. when you got 600 stores and it's the number one selling product by far yeah. in the dairy case that's not fringe that's central Mm-hmm. That is 23 years of hard work educating people and people having a great experience wanting more. And yeah. so it's sad how some, not all, I'm not going to blame everybody, but some in the media have an incredible bias towards uh, not doing, they don't do their research. They don't actually do their homework. I guess it's too hard to do yeah. the homework, uh, to read PubMed and, and, and understand the rationale behind uh, what, why breastfeeding is so fantastic for your infants. Mm-hmm. Did yeah. you know that there's not any medical organization in the world, none that I've heard of anyway, mm-hmm. that says do not breastfeed your young? They all say, I didn't know that. please <laughs> breast, breastfeed your babies okay. because it gives you this massive list of all these fantastic benefits. Yeah. It goes on and on and on. The World Health Organization, the FDA, the USDA, the pediatricians, the gynecologists, the OB gynecologists, the neonatologists. Uh, the, everybody, yeah. everybody, all the nursing organizations, everybody breastfeed your babies. In fact, uh, the dietary guidelines for the USDA says, first thing, breastfeed your babies. Mm-hmm. And they have this litany of several pages of all these fantastic reasons why. Humans are mammals. Yeah. Breast milk is raw milk. Historically, we've consumed deer milk, mares, uh, horse milk mule milk donkey milk mm-hmm. uh camel's milk uh, absolutely goat's milk and, and horse milk and, and cow's milk and, and sheep milk all over the world yeah and because when we could find a camel uh, an animal that could lactate create milk we had whole food then you didn't have to harvest you didn't have to wait for right something there, to grow you didn't yeah. have to, to hunt or fish mm-hmm. you had food today yeah so sunshine a little bit of grass and you were good you had food and that old food by the way was called cheese yeah and Mm -hmm. been food for the ages so it's very interesting to see that when you're breastfeeding that's fantastic Mm -hmm. but if you change one species off you go to humans to any other mammals everybody freaks out yeah and that is so narrow-minded and ignorant Mm -hmm. because if they just Um, studied the natural history they would see how how many different animals we've been drinking the milk of 100 percent, 100 percent. the moss and it's like, okay even. they're concerned about you getting ill i get that i understand that mm-hmm. but it also talks a lot about how weakened <clears throat> our immune systems have become in the last 
80 to 100 years too. Mm -hmm. So how do you build your immune system? Bring back the biodiversity of the bandwidth of all the different kind of bacteria that you need in your body to exercise your immune system, have antibodies against all this bandwidth, wide, wide bandwidth, instead of being so um, immune to pro compromise, having narrow uh, antibodies to, to just a few. Yeah. So that was that was really uh, a big bring home on the COVID deal because those that had narrow, weakened immune systems got sick. Yeah. Those that had strong immune systems and more healthy lifestyles did better. Exactly. Um, and so it's a it's a coming home. Uh, the the chickens are coming home to roost kind of a thing where you know what. Health is driven by nutrition. Health is driven by yeah. the, the bandwidth of genetic information we have in our gut. Yeah, I really um, hope so. I hope the tide is turning in that direction, yeah. Well, we, we know it's turning for some people. Mm -hmm. uh, and we hope that it turns for more and more people because everybody deserves a shot at, at a healthy, long life. But I tell you, it, it, the waves against us, the tides against us are so yeah. high and so big because industry absolutely hates what we're doing. Yeah. Uh, the dairy industry has no love lost for us at all. I mean, oh, yeah. we are basically giving it to the processing industry big time because we're stealing shelf space and customers and they don't want no part of what we're doing because mm -hmm. they can't replicate it. They can't go and get milk from 50 different dairies and put it in one milk tank mm -hmm. and do anything but pasteurize it. So we are causing literally a paradigm fracture. Yeah. A major change, which is very uncomfortable for those that are sitting in the helm of wealth on our current paradigm, which is capitalized on people's illness and and ignoring what really the gut needs, mm -hmm. which is whole nutrition. Yeah. Would you say like uh, for that tide to go in our favor, um, it would literally just be the consumers making the decision. If the consumers made a big, massive shift in their consumption decisions, would that be all that it takes? Dollar voting. Mm hmm Dollar voting by people to fill up grocery stores, uh, gro grocery baskets, I should say. The ones that, the, the moms, the, the dads that go to the stores and buy food, they literally run the show. Mm -hmm. Because if they don't buy it, it dies. If they buy it, it thrives. So the more informed people we have about what builds the immune system, whole food nutrition, mm -hmm. the more we're going to have whole, whole food nutrition if they make that choice uh, in America, for the better or for the worse, <laughs> one way or the other, uh, we are driven by money. Yeah. So dollar voting matters. It really does. So if you have a very popular product that solves your problems, mm -hmm. it tastes good, makes you feel better, it makes your children healthier, people are going to do more of it. Yeah, They're going to tell their neighbors and their friends and whoever else, do this because your children have sniffles and ear infections and fevers and colds and all this kind of stuff and mine don't or they have very few of them and then that trend is going to push so i've always believed that instead of fighting the fda or fighting somebody or saying this is unfair don't focus on any of that focus mm -hmm. on one or two things number one make your food safe yeah. use the most advanced technologies fax pcr or whatever you need to do to test to make sure you don't have pathogenic bacteria in your milk mm -hmm. and do a great job of educating. We have a saying here at raw farm, you don't sell raw milk, you teach it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. You, you teach raw milk. Once the consumers know it'll be, a, a but, you better. know, once people understand what their immune system is, mm -hmm. the gut microbiome drives 80% of it. Yeah. Uh, and that your health is driven by that large immune system organ, the intestines and the gut, the microbiome, mm -hmm. they're going to start to say, was that last food I chose good for the good microbiome or bad for it? Yeah. They're and they're going to start be saying, there's going to be consequences to what I eat and what my health outcomes are. And this is driven all the way to people who have Crohn's disease and irritable bowel syndrome and celiac disease that realize that they can control those disease processes and get better and not have surgery and poop in a plastic bag by changing their gut microbiome and getting rid of the inflammation. Yeah. We have so many people that have, that have uh, started consuming raw milk kefir, whole food diets, and yeah. avocados and olive oils and all these wonderful things, um, butyric acid uh, foods like raw butter, and, and getting rid of that inflammation in their gut and literally getting off all our medications within six months and being cured, wow. healed, healed from inflammation in their gut. However, that manifested whether it was irritable bowel, whether it was celiac, whether it was pain, mm -hmm. whether that was 
GERD, whether that was uh, Crohn's disease. I mean, there's a whole bunch of people I know that have recovered fully and did not have to have surgery and are not on medications anymore. Would you say your uh, raw milk kefir is the most healthy product you have in terms of beneficial bacteria content? 100%. Okay. And it's historically, if you think about it, it really makes a lot of sense too. Uh, if you go back 150 years ago, 100 years ago, uh, even you go back, go to Kenya right now and look at the Maasai, mm-hmm. or you look at uh, the Mongolians in Outer Mongolia in, in, in China, the container that they have to hold the milk that they get from the mammal that they're, they're milking, whether it's a cow, goat, sheep, horse, yeah. uh, the, the uh, uh, Mongolians do a lot of horse milk. Oh, you mentioned this clean. on Paul Saladino's <laughs> podcast. Yeah, I remember you talked about this, the dirty it's, bucket. It's not, it, that gourd or that vessel is not clean. Yeah. It has the residual milk uh, deposits from two or three days ago or a week ago or two weeks ago. Mm-hmm. And those are the cultures, those are the bacterial cultures found oh, in that culture there, that location. Mm-hmm. So you put fresh milk in there and it's warm. Yeah. So warm milk going into a unclean, culture-rich environment, and they don't chill it. Yeah. It becomes kefir. Oh wow. And that, that kefir drops pH from in the mid sixes down to three point nine, becomes acidic, mm-hmm. and it starts to separate in a curtain way. And guess what? You've got something that will last for months as yeah. a fermented product. Yeah. And it's extremely probiotic, extremely biodiverse. It's delicious. You can mix other things with it. You can actually put it through a cheesecloth and make farmer's cheese out of it by adding a little salt. You'll actually salt and, and, and maybe some herbs. You'll have yourself a farmer's cheese in the cheesecloth. And then the way that goes through it, you use that to lacto ferment your vegetables. Yeah. So, or, or meats, uh, the whey proteins are, are fantastic for lacto fermentation. So it's, it's really the wisdom of the ages that is lost on the 21st century in modern medicine is just capitalize, capitalizing on disease processes that make money. Yeah. Would, what would you say is um, the difference between like probiotics that you find in like a kombucha tea versus the probiotics in a yogurt? Are they totally different or do they have similar benefits? No, they, they're different. Mm-hmm. Uh, I don't think that they're, they're, it's not either or, it's not one's good or one's bad. Mm-hmm. They're just specific to that particular food product. So okay. kombucha is a SCOBY, a symbiotic culture of bacteria and yeast, right? Yeah. SCOBY, S-C-O-B-Y. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, 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 you know, it's got all kinds of interesting bacteria and yeasts that grow on the sugars in that, that kombucha. Okay. Uh, milk is not so much yeast at all. It's mostly probiotic bacteria that are eating prebiotics. Remember, prebiotics feed probiotics that create postbiotics okay postbiotics are the the metabolites of the metabolization the the consumption of of prebiotics by probiotics the bacteria eating prebiotics so you have probiotics eating prebiotics creating postbiotics Mm -hmm. those postbiotics the waste of the metabolites are actually building blocks of life okay and that's those those are super super important in building blocks okay and when you don't have adequate metabolites coming out of that process you can actually be nutritionally depraved okay uh you don't you can't you, you can't build the things you need to build yeah. without these metabolites these postbiotics so that's absolutely so, necessary in the human diet 100 percent. okay 100 we are a a uh a, just a a kiln a a a a, pl- a vessel that takes in food mm-hmm. for our bacteria to consume and liberate things we need for our bodies minerals become bioavailable. Yeah. The vitamins are actually created by bacteria. Enzymes mm-hmm. are made by bacteria. Lactobacillus makes lact- lactase enzyme. Those all mm-hmm. came, all these things are completed and 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 made more whole and more complete and rounded off yeah. uh, by these bacterial functions in our body. Without bacteria in our body, we'd last about, I don't know, one or two days and we'd die. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. Bacteria are critical. Yeah. Critical. And there's like a fear of bacteria, like we got to always wash our hands and wash our body, keep ourselves almost sterile. But that's like we're plastic wrapping ourselves like we talked about, like we got to exactly. we got to be going outside and having contact with these bacteria, the the good ones. Yeah, we do. Mm-hmm. And the more contact you have with good bacteria and the food that feeds it, the less effect on our bodies bad bacteria will have because okay. we've 
occupied all the spaces in our body with good bacteria and we fed them well. Yeah. Um, we've not taken antibiotics. We haven't taken preservatives. We haven't consumed a bunch of allergenic foods like pasteurized dairy products that don't have the probiotics in them because they've been killed off. Mm -hmm. uh, so yes, you're exactly right. Yeah, I, I hope more people realize that because like we are just this big symphony of bacteria talking to each other. It's like a, yes. a whole other universe that you, you don't yes. get to see. Um, and uh, I want to talk about uh, that more with another guest I have this week who I can't believe. You know what that, yeah. you know what that universe is called? What is it? It's called the Milky Way. Oh, that's yeah. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> that's, a, that's a great joke. Um, but Thank you. I was going to tell you, this week I got another farmer that I am uh, doing a podcast with, and I can't believe he agreed to do it with me because of how big he is. It's, uh, it's Will Harris yes. of Bluffton, Georgia. Yeah. So I want to talk to him a little bit about raw milk and everything that he knows and because it was from his podcast i listened to on joe rogan where i learned that um if consumers just changed their consumption choices the whole thing would start to shift because the consumers hold all the power well you're right mm -hmm. and guess who is going to be really really upset it's going to be all those processors all those people that that make money off of literally taking advantage of farmers, mm -hmm. the dairymen that are going bankrupt, committing suicide because they have no money. They have no means to make money because the processors pay them below cost of production. Okay. They're gonna be the generated generation that lost the farm. Mm -hmm. When mom and dad and grandparents did okay, and this is the generation they lose it. So you're exactly right. Dollar voting drives decisions. But I tell you what, there's a tremendous amount of resistance yeah. from those that have money want to hold on to it. And mm. so the truth just doesn't come in and say, I'm here. This is fantastic. Yeah. No, it's suppressed. It's made into an enemy. It's, uh, uh, I'm created, uh, you know, some people make me into a villain. Uh, when I am a pretty solid humanitarian guy who believes in ethics, morals, and health, and whole food nutrition using modern science and good principles and mother nature's blueprints mm -hmm. for the betterment of, of the world, but yet to, to hear some of these people on the most wicked thing that ever walked the earth because I'm taking money from some people and giving it to farmers that are best in the butt to serve humanity. Yeah. So there's a very interesting fog of war on here. It's the food war. It's uh, a very complicated that, problem, right? A complex yes, it is. with a lot of factors. Yeah, it's kind of like the we'll back to real. Yeah, kind of like uh, protecting the Amazon rainforest. It's not a simple solution to that either because um, like a lot of people need to make a living as loggers there. That's how they put food on their plate. And so you got to replace their logging careers with something else in order to protect the Amazon. Exactly. And exactly. and that's ecotourism, apparently. Like, ecotourism has the potential to replace uh, logging. And that will bring the deforestation to a bit of a halt of the Amazon, which is really interesting. Um, and then back back with the food, food industry and, and all that, there's a lot of documentaries that have really, uh, I think, impacted millions of people and consumer decisions like... Uh, have you heard of the biggest little farm documentary? Yes. Yeah, yes. that's a great one. That one I've, I've rewatched multiple times. Yeah, um, that's like kind of what inspired me to make a short film. So, if I can just kind of reveal to people uh, that watch it all the natural processes that need to be harnessed and the benefits that go along with it, that's what I'm trying to do. Exactly what they did in that documentary. It was amazing. Um, and then Food Inc. Have you heard uh, watched that one? Very much. Mm -hmm. Very much. Yeah. So, yeah, I'm, actually, I'm actually part of Food Forward and some other uh, documentaries that have been made. Oh, wow. Uh, and a Food few of them. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's awesome because this is kind of what I'm trying to do. I'm in the very beginning stages of it right now, but I want to eventually make one kind of at, at that level in my life. But that is awesome. You said Food Forward? Food Forward, yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll look that up. Um, yep. But uh, on the topic of documentaries, I wanted to mention um, – I heard some of them like are giving inaccurate information saying that we got to go toward a more of a plant-based diet like um cowspiracy that was one that because now i don't know who to believe i'm just watching these documentaries one of them I, I might i might be able to help you a little bit with that mm -hmm. um, mothers that give birth vegan vegan mothers i'm talking not talking vegetarian i'm talking about vegan mm -hmm. strict vegan mothers that give birth to babies and nurse their babies are giving their babies raw animal fat. Okay. Because that is a very, very big wake up call. Mm -hmm. Part of the blueprint design for humans is to have animal fat. Mm -hmm. um, 
because breast milk has, you know, four or 5% butterfat in it. And that fat carries 60%, the butterfat globule in the milk, by the yeah. way, this is International Milk Genomics Consortium information. I'm, I'm going to be, I'll be going to Ireland here in about another four weeks okay. to go to my 14th International Milk Genomics Consortium meeting. That's awesome. But the butterfat mul- uh, globule carries 60% of the bioactive elements, the beneficial elements in raw milk. Mm -hmm. So skim milk sucks by definition. If you lose the fat, that's where it's at. But the bioactive elements are so critical to the immune system (laughs) function. These Mm -hmm. are lactoferrins and the alkaline phosphatases and all these wonderful things that are found in in milk that are bioactive, they're they're found in the butterfat. So vegan mom breastfeeds her baby, the baby gets raw fat. Animal fat. That's a very big clue that, in fact, vegans are missing something really critical, and that is fats, good animal fats and animal proteins. Now, yeah. I'm going to tell you right now, I am not a, a purist at all about don't eat vegetables and only eat meats. Mm-hmm. I am a Mediterranean diet kind of guy. Same when here, you look yeah. at the blue, the blue zones around the world in Sardinia, Greece, and Okinawa, uh, Japan, and all these places around the world where people live to be 100 years old and die with a smile on their face and no disease and very little disease, what are they eating? They're eating whole foods. They're eating yeah. uh, high fat. They're eating vegetables. They're eating pastas. They're eating very little sugar. They're eating. They're having rich social engagement amongst themselves. Mm-hmm. They have plenty of sunshine. They've got plenty of fermented raw uh, cheese. Yeah, I mean the, the teas cheeses are incredibly great. fermented, right? The way that they've got maggots growing through their cheeses. I mean, yeah, so wow. <laughs> those are kind of the places I look to for counsel mm-hmm. in terms of models of health. Yeah, and that's a biodiversity of bacteria supported by whole food nutrition, and that includes vegetables and and animals, all of it in balance, and it's cornucopia yeah. of beautiful nature. What it is? That's kind of the way I see it. And with a person with a good gut. You can enjoy those things. Yeah. But I will say some people that have a, a gut that's been turned on its head and the microbiome's not working, maybe some vegetables won't work for you. Uh, but I do know that people with a good, healthy gut, vegetables are a wonderful part of it. And yeah. so are fruits. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, all these wonderful things, this cornucopia of life, go well with a healthy gut. Yeah, just having like a balanced diet is now kind of yeah. be, not popular anymore. It's like You got to be either all in or all out. But like what no, happened it, to the it, balance? <laughs> swinging pendulum right you yeah these people in crisis and they find a solution and they say that's the answer everybody has to follow yeah i want more of a a generalist saying heal your gut mm-hmm. heal your gut use your raw dairy use your all your wonderful avocados and all these kinds of things to, to heal your gut but then nourish your gut with a plentiful diversity of wonderful food we have mm-hmm. you don't have to just swing one way or the other you can swing and enjoy it all yeah and I am I am a little bit leaning toward animal products, although I still yeah. will eat a lot of fruits and sometimes vegetables. And sure, but for me, it's like, is it well sourced? Uh, that's a big factor. Yeah. And Good like, point. can't just Good eat uh, factory farmed meat and be healthy. Oh. Yeah. So it's like, um, the way I look at it uh, is like tier like the best type of meat, t- like the tier one of meat is like wild game meat, which is like right. from from nature, um, and then tier two is like pasture raised, organic, nothing done to it. Um, so yeah, we got a, a wild game meat shop nearby and, uh, I got, I, right now I have some elk meat and some, all types of, uh, deer venison and stuff in our freezer right now. And I think that's the best, like, cause I feel great. That's one. That's awesome. One, that's great. Yeah. It's like, if you feel amazing after a meal, you, you know, it must be doing something good to you. Um, whereas like when I went vegan for, I, w- I was vegan for a month just to like see you know this was uh years ago back when i didn't know who to believe i don't know what was right but they were really pushing that vegan diet was really healthy way of living and stuff so i tried it out but toward the end i was just like feeling weaker and more tired and then i'm like if my body's saying no it must not be the healthiest diet so yeah yeah. there's yeah We, we see i'll pick up the vegans just a little bit more and then i'll I'll give them a hug and they'll be okay. But, yeah. <laughs> uh, a lot of them are very angry. Um, they don't feel good. They have, they're torturing themselves. They literally don't feel good. Yeah. You add a little bit of good cholesterol back in there, good animal fats back in there, and they feel tremendously better very mm-hmm. quickly within a few days. Uh, it's a balanced diet, guys. It's not all one or the other. It's mm-hmm. it's it's the diet that Mother Nature's blueprints 
clearly shown us for yeah. tens of thousands of years has been that diet. And there's, there's something to be said of maybe intermittent fasting a little bit to allow your, your metabolism to kind of normalize and get your blood sugars back in check. Mm -hmm. uh, there's some really cool stuff that the Norwegians do with, with cold water treatment and, and warm and cold, warm and cold exercise, but not too much, yeah. uh, not the mm -hmm. wrong kind. So I think we could just look at the examples of those that have lived healthy before us mm -hmm. and replicate the best models we can going forward. Yeah. And, um, to, to tie back into what we were talking about with like the medicine industry and what they're what they're teaching versus the reality of it like um they never talk about like the the quality of protein or the quality of fat like i i bought some bone marrow from polyface farm like these bones with the marrow you just push it out and i put it on my cast iron and it was like they call it god's butter so it was amazing <laughs> yeah <laughs> And I felt great after eating it, but I asked my doctor friend, he's he's on he's almost a doctor now, but the stuff he's learning, he's telling me that that's bad for me because he's saying that fat's fat and it doesn't matter if it's bone marrow. They're not being taught that there's different types of fat with, like you can't have fat from a donut and get health benefits that you would get from having fat from bone marrow, even though they're both fat. That's something that's not really being taught. Unfortunately, medical schools are really lagging Mm -hmm. And the most recent, the most, the most current research mm -hmm. talks about high fat diets or higher fats diets from good um, sources of fat mm -hmm. are associated with long life, are associated with less mortality and, wow. and, and, and her health. And so they're still stuck in the 1960s and 70s with this low fat diet thing, which was a bunch of crap to begin with. Mm -hmm. uh, the research was not ever grounded. It, it was actually quite biased. And some of the research done in the 30s, 40s, mostly the 40s and 60s, was extremely biased for greedy corporate rationale. Okay. They would come up with they would come up with studies that said whatever you wanted it to say to make money. I mean, cigarettes were good for your lungs, and DDT was good <laughs> for your skin, and you know that kind of crap, right? Yeah. So we have to kind of get beyond that and go to our more socially responsible study basis, which actually looks at studies for the betterment of humanity versus the betterment of somebody's paycheck someplace. And what's good for us as a country or as a people, what's good for whole, you know, us as a world. And think of that versus what's gonna be better for our stock value tomorrow morning at Wall Street. Yeah, exactly. Um, there's another question I had planned to ask you. It's, uh, it's about like meat being, meat and animal products being well-sourced like versus industrially farmed. So for your farm, uh, the cows are they uh, grass fed entire their entire lives? And no, okay, it's it's seasonal and it's intermittent. Right now, the cows are not on grass during the day because it's so hot. We're 107 to 110 degrees here, so our mm -hmm. cows are spending time in these shades. They have these beautiful shades with bed pack so that they actually can stay clean and dry and, and not stressed in the heat. Okay. So uh, we do do a lot of pasturing here, but it's not every day of the year. It's on. Uh, you know, maybe the early morning, the late afternoons when the cows can get the pasture. We have a lot of pasture here. We have hundreds of acres of pasture, yeah. but we don't necessarily give it to them all the time because it's too darn hot. During these, the fall, springtime, a lot more pasturing is going on in the summertime. Okay, yeah, because I saw some really cool footage on your channel with like the rotational like paddock, paddock grazing. I forgot what yep. the term was, but yeah. Rotational intensive grazing. Yep. Okay, yeah, that we was awesome. That. Yeah, we do that. So it changes the, it changes the CLA, the conjugate linoleic acid value in the milk. Okay, it, it uh, does all kinds of wonderful things. Um, it also keeps the cows clean because mm -hmm. they're laying out in fresh pasture versus a pile of manure. Okay, um, yeah. Although we manage our manure piles in such a way that it's all dry, there's oh, no wet, yeah. which is important. It's kind of like a comfortable bed, but mm -hmm. at the same time, we want the cows to be in sunshine and grass as long as it's not too hot. Okay. And so, like, what what is the difference between a milk that, like, for instance, I saw like a Costco milk. It said organic, and but it didn't say grass fed. It just said organic, and it was whole milk. And uh, I tried it a little bit of it at my neighbor's house who had it. And so, like, what's the difference between that and like a entirely grass fed milk? Because it's saying it's organic, but it never said it's grass fed. So was that what did that cow I, eat? It's entirely. I think that the words you didn't say are more more important than the words you did you did say. Mm. Most often, the organic milk that you find wherever you're going to find it is going to be ultra high temperature pasteurized or UHT. Oh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's 220 to 280 degrees uh, for a few seconds. 
which makes it literally completely dead. Yeah. It's and just, that gives yeah. it a 60 to 90 day shelf life. Even though the, that milk started out as an organic raw milk, mm-hmm. it's now organic certified, completely dead milk. Mm-hmm. And that, that, in my opinion, has lost so much of its value. Oh, yeah. All the bioactive elements are gone. The anti-inflammatory comments are gone. It's just as allergenic as pasteurized milk from a regular dairy. Exactly. It's just as hard to digest. So there's a, a saying from um, uh, the, originator, the originator of the modern organic movement. He said, J.I. Rodale said in the 60s, it's not organic. Produce organic milk and then pasteurize it, unquote. Mm, okay. So the one reason that organic dairies are suffering so much right now, so many have been lost. We've lost over 90, about 80% of our organic dairies in California are gone now. Um, was because of cheating by the big guys that don't pasture their cows and don't follow the rules in other states. They've lost their innate value in the milk because it doesn't matter how yeah. many cows you've got or how, how quickly you milk the cows because the innate value was in the raw side, mm-hmm. not being organic. So organic, I, I, it, it's really a, quite a tragic story in the last 15 years to see the loss of so many organic dairies. Definitely, yeah. I wish uh, the the regulations like loosen up a bit where it becomes more and more legal in other states where people can purchase raw milk. Um, well, Iowa just changed their law. Oh, Iowa okay. just changed their law. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's that's very awesome. exciting. Yeah. yeah, July 1st, it's legal to produce raw milk there in Iowa. So, I don't know the specific regulations of Michigan, but it's probably, I know it's one of the worst. Like, it's the hardest to sell raw milk in Michigan than most it's, other states, it's right? Cow shares. You've got to get cow shares. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. I got to find some. Yeah, Wendy in, up in Serendipity Farm, she told me about herd shares. So that's probably what you're talking about. Like cow shares. Yes, okay. same, same thing. Same okay. concept. Yeah. yeah, I'll look into that. Yeah. And uh, so I got one more question. It's, um, w- this is something to do with carbon sequestration because Will Harris, sure. yeah, Will Harris is always saying in his podcasts and interviews that his farm is carbon, not even carbon neutral, it's carbon negative because of right. his pasture is so healthy. It's just taking in all that atmospheric carbon, right. locking it into the soil. So right. my question is like, ha- have there been like scientific studies done or peer reviewed papers with data published on on the potential of that like rotational grazing for carbon sequestration yeah there is uh, a whole grant system here in california called alternative manure management Mm -hmm. and one of their their uh, suggested things to do is pasturing your cows and the the pasturing your cows actually shows a very very good carbon sink Mm -hmm. where you're actually absorbing carbon dioxide and sinking it into the soil um, in the roots of the, of the pasture and actually doing a good job of, of cleaning up the environment, right? Mm-hmm. So, yes, there are studies on that. Okay. I wish there were more studies. I wish there was more definitive studies. Yeah. But I do know that, that pasturing your cows is a very good way to sequester carbon. Yeah, that's something uh, I've been having some trouble finding to support my synthesis paper, which is due literally tomorrow. As I'm searching in these library systems, there's not much uh, data on that. But no. I found a few, but I wish there were more. And I, if anything, I'll I'll jump in and do a study with some scientists because like that's... that would that would be a unique study. It's not easy mm-hmm. to study that and understand it. You have to really mm-hmm. uh, get it's into the dirt, one. as they say. Yeah. yeah. Um, but that is where my Hold on like... just a moment. Hold oh, on yeah, just a sure. second. Yep. Go right with you. Okay. Yeah. yeah so. No, because uh, I was just gonna say that 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 right there, carbon sequestration with livestock rotational grazing. That's something I'm highly passionate in with food production. It's almost not even food production anymore. It's like ecosystem management. And it is. Yeah. It so is. like I'm, I'm kind of a mix between wildlife biology and food production. So that's where I really, because I could spend my time outside uh, managing cattle all day. Like I love doing that right. stuff, being out there. And yeah, so that's something I want to look into. And um, with, the, with the carbon sequestration, uh, Alan Savory and his uh, all the stuff that he's done is really inspirational, and I wish that's why I wish there were more peer-reviewed papers and raw data that could be used to support some of those claims because that, I feel like that's one of the things a little bit missing right now. I wish there were more of it with the numbers. Unfortunately, here in America, our grant system, which actually supports studies, mm-hmm. comes from big agricultural institutions and organizations. And they're not looking for answers that don't go easily with their their business models, right? Mm-hmm. If you've got a twenty thousand cow dairy that doesn't do any pasturing, has big manure problems with you know uh, 
lagoons and methane and all that stuff. Yeah. They're going to be doing more research on things like uh, digesters to okay. capture methane to create power. Then they are going to be doing any kind of work on pasture grazing because yeah. they don't pasture graze. Yeah. So the the money follows the grant system, follows the research, goes to the universities. It it all goes together with industrial interests. So mm -hmm. that's why you see a very few PubMed articles uh, coming from grassroots because there's just no money to, to support it. Okay, gotcha. So that is that where like the uh, the potential of a documentary, a very successful documentary, might come in, where that sure. changes it, just kind of rocks everything up with like how it presents, how nature is all interconnected, how animals change the landscape, and it just shows the like that livestock rotational grazing of livestock actually sequesters carbon. That would be something. I, I think I think that that is part of it. Mm -hmm. I think that if you had a holistic approach to a story mm -hmm. that let's say you had a child and i know several that had severe asthma mm -hmm. and and peanut allergies and leaky gut syndrome and spent time in the icu and had every medication known to man and then got into deep nutrition for six months and raw dairy was involved in it yeah. and now he doesn't have asthma doesn't have peanut allergy doesn't have leaky gut syndrome now runs track and doing great getting yeah. cats anything else and you go back to the farmer and you go back to the food chain that supports that um that tells a story and, and oh, it's yeah. not just that it's, it's the crohn's patient it's it's linking good outcomes to good nutrition and good farming yeah mm -hmm. that's a great story in my opinion yeah uh, it's an acute medical problem with tears and all that terrible stuff all the way back to food choices mm -hmm. to the farm and the soil, cows, whatever, earthworms, whatever the story you want to tell, yeah. carbon sequestration, all goes together. Yeah, It all goes together. It, it creates a hell of a story that is very uncomfortable, very inconvenient. Yeah, for, for uh, everything else that's already yeah. in place. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. That's why like, I want to kind of talk about animals managing and changing the landscape. I want to include examples of like Yell Yellowstone National Park, how when sure. wolves were reintroduced, the, the rivers shifted a little bit. The, they say the wolves changed the rivers because the you probably know about the elk situation. And yeah, that's kind of what I want to tie into it. And because um, bison are being so reintroduced. Doc, I've, got a, yeah. I've got to go here in a few minutes because I'm oh, yeah. over my hour. But oh I've yeah, got sure. Some other things going on. Okay, yeah, I can end it. I, I, got, I got all the important questions done. Uh, great. It was a great one hour conversation, a little over an hour. Yeah, so thank you for your time. I learned a lot. I might, uh, probably gonna re listen to this conversation to fully digest everything. And yeah. Feel free to reach out to me if you need any resources or links or any data. Oh, yeah. I've got a whole library of it to help you with. Okay, I'll give you um, a call or an email. Yeah. Okay, sounds Thanks. great. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. You betcha. Take care. Bye bye. Right, bye.